if you look in the network folder, I've added a new item, Campus SEO2 Webmaster Tools. I'll go ahead and get a copy of that from the network folder. We'll open it up and look at it in general, and then we will do what's here. This is a, this is a hands-on thing. Today is the day where, if you've got a website, and if you've got your login information and such for your website, what we're going to do is connect your website to the search engines. If you don't have a website, that's okay. We can still create the account on the search engine, and then eventually when we um, get your website, then we'll, you'll be able to connect your website to the search engine. So the idea is we're going to set up the webmaster tools. We're going to do this for both Google and Bing. I said last time we're using two of the big search engines. So uh, let's look at the handout first. And the one labeled number two, Webmaster Tools. So it's two pages long, but I want to jump over to page two first. Go to your second page. Conversion goals. Might sound a little redundant if you know the terminology, but let's talk about it here in the notes. Conversions. <coughs> if you've heard of that term in marketing, especially, I guess, if does anyone have an opinion? What is a conversion? Uh, sale. sale. Sure. Any other definitions? Transformation. Transformation. Okay. So conversions. Uh, conversion has different terms. For us, the one that makes a little bit more uh, sense would be sales, but it's not only sales. I'm going to define it as any action that is a result of your efforts. Uh, classically, in marketing, the conversion is a sale. We've converted a non-customer into a customer. We made a sale. That was a conversion. Any action that is a result of your efforts. Okay. Someone following me on Twitter is a conversion. I'm not actually making money off of that directly, but I've converted them from a non-follower on Twitter into a follower on Twitter. Someone subscribing to my newsletter is a conversion. I've converted them from a non-subscriber to the newsletter to a subscriber. Ultimately, the point that they're following me on Twitter, that they're subscribed to me on my newsletter, that they're visiting my site, is I want to make sales. So you could say that the ultimate conversion, often for most of us, is a sale. There are many types of conversions, but often the ultimate conversion is a sale. almost fits. So it's, it's a sale. But it's perfectly legitimate to have many other conversions before that one. And it's often very common. It's very easy to get a like on Facebook. And it's very easy to get a follower on Twitter. And it's very easy for someone to visit your website. But then suddenly it's so much harder for them to click buy or donate uh, or whatever your ultimate goal is. Uh, I keep talking about in this class and last time about how I'm talking about companies and products and brands and all of that. But everything that you learn about SEO also applies to anything. If I'm a writer and I simply want to write short stories, I'm not selling them, I just want to be creative and I want people to read them and like them or have a reaction, SEO also applies. I want to convert them from a non-reader to a reader. That's my ultimate conversion. I'm not asking for money. just want them to read. So my handout here, conversion goals. You could think about uh, conversion is also a goal. You must decide the goals of your company early on. In my fictional business, Victor's Bakery, I want people to buy cupcakes. That's a conversion goal. That's the ultimate conversion goal of that company. In order to get to that goal, I may have many conversions um, and goals before that. So here's some examples. And then with deeper explanation here. All of these bullet points that I have here are good goals for you to have, good conversions to try to get. Uh, I'm not saying that if you do all of these, you will have 100% success. 
Uh, I'm saying to think about doing as many of these as you can, and that makes sense to you, and that you're able to do. So for this first one, Twitter. This assumes you have a Twitter account. So followers on Twitter are a captive audience. The whole point of a follower a follower is one that has chosen to see all your ads. I'll put ads or advertisements in quotes. Um, your the, the whole point of being on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that for a business is because you're going to create ads. And you know, for some that'll that sounds like very crass. Like, well, I'm just advertising and commercials. I don't I don't like that. I don't want to do that. You don't have to think about it that way, but that's how it sort of is. Because I have Victor's Bakery, and I love to bake, but I also would like my business to make money and for me not to go bankrupt. So I have to do all that I can to sell cupcakes in the various the whole spectrum of how I'm going to handle that. At the very minimum. Getting followers on Twitter is a way for them, for me to then tweet every once in a while, hey everyone, sale this Saturday, use this coupon code to get 10% off. And so those, those that have chosen to follow me are my captive audience will get the message. And therefore if I get more people to follow me, I can get more people to get the message. More followers, more potential customers. But again, unfortunately, a like does not equal a sale. A follow does not equal a sale. 10,000 followers doesn't mean I have 10,000 sales. So the more followers that I have, the better because reality check. But 10% is, you know. You're being way too optimistic. 10%? <laughs> <Yeah>. 1%. <laughs> oh, yeah. Reality yeah. check 1% of your followers. But it's very good, yes. 1% of your followers are your real followers or the ones that will follow through and make a sale. In the real world, marketing in the real world is that billboard on the street or the radio ad. A thousand people a day or an hour or whatever will see that billboard. Does that mean I'm making a thousand sales from that billboard? No, I'm making 1% of sales or 2% or if I'm amazing, 10%. And I would still rather have 10% than 0%. But the point with, with followers and such on social media is that it's often very, very, very low, the ones that are actually going to do anything and follow through and subscribe or buy or, or donate or whatever. So if I've got 100 followers, what's 1% of that? Not a true question. One. One percent of 100 is one person. So if I've got 100 followers, maybe one of those people will be the one that buys. Is that sustainable enough for my business? One sale? Maybe. Probably not. So if I've got a thousand followers, what's one percent of a thousand? Ten. Ten sales. Okay, better than one, better than zero, but maybe not as much. Okay, ten thousand and so forth. As I get more followers, that one percent gets larger. So even if it's one percent of people that are the most, that are the real followers, the real subscribers and buyers, the more followers you have, the 1% is a bigger number. So one goal would be get followers on Twitter or any social network. But I've got here get followers on Twitter because that will help to my ultimate goal. Next one. Get social interactions on Facebook. Okay, social interactions. These are like reply, share, oh, there's one more, and then there's one more. Now, every social network has their version of it. Um, maybe nowadays they should be, I think they're more commonly now called reactions. Um, but f likes the thumbs up on Facebook, that was the classic. I, I enjoy your picture, I will give it a like. Okay, the next kind of 
interaction is, I liked your picture so much, I'm going to say something about it. I'm going to write a reply and tell you something. Like, you know, great photo, or that looks tasty, or where can I buy it? It's a reply. A share, or a reshare, or a retweet. Okay, so a simple, often positive, could be negative, a, a, a simple response, a reply, um, more effort to uh, say something. A share or a reshare is sort of like an email forwarding your content or going viral. If I post a really funny cat picture or a really tasty cupcake picture on my Facebook and someone really liked it so much, they did the share and they passed it on. They forwarded it to more people. Let's say on Facebook I have five followers <clears throat> and one person really liked my cupcake and they did share and they shared it to their 500 followers, 500 friends. Well, now I've reached 505 people, the original five that I had to direct connection to and the friends of friends. That's going viral. It goes from one account or one person to another to another and so forth. So these, I have them in order of importance. A like is the least important because it's someone just clicking the like or thumbs up or whatever and moving on. A like is not bad at all. I'm just saying it's the least valuable. The one that's bad is someone does nothing. You get ignored. So even getting likes has some value. And in the social media class, we would talk about more in detail about each of these, their values, and how to capitalize on them. But a like um, shows that someone is at least minimally interested in my content. But it's very transitory. In our short attention span culture, I click a like, I move on, what's next? OK, the next level up is a reply. Someone cared a little bit more to reply with like a great job, or a that looks tasty, or a thumbs up, or a little emoji face or something. It's They're putting a little bit more effort. They have to do like three clicks to do that, whereas a like is just one click. Tap, like, move on. The reply is, click the button to start to type, type, send. More clicks, more effort. They might be a little bit more valuable as a possible uh, resource to market to. Even more effort and higher up is the share. They're helping me go viral. They're helping me spread the word. Like, reply, share. There's one more related to that. Anyone might know what that is? What's another social media interaction that's valuable that people can do on your... Yeah. Direct message? Mm, direct message. I would equate it a little bit like the reply. It's obviously more directly to you, but it's still a little bit of back and forth communication. There is the. What's that? I would sort of equate that also with a share because it's um, helping you go viral. They might link to you or link your site elsewhere out. Um, there's the follow. They liked your content so much, they're going to subscribe to you. They're going to follow you and keep up to date with all of your tweets, all your Facebook posts, all your snaps on Snapchat. So then that one is uh, growing your audience. And this last one, sale, which that's the hardest one because it's so easy to click like and reply and even follow. But suddenly it's so hard to click. Suddenly the mouse doesn't work and I can't <laughs> click on buy or donate or anything like that. Yeah. One question when you're talking about share, you said if somebody had 500 followers or 500 people. Heard that on our Facebook post that even if we have a thought a thousand people or a thousand friends, we're not reaching all thousand every time we post something. Is that, that is completely correct and unfortunate. That Facebook, because they are the biggest social net network of all, and uh, they're the 800-pound gorilla, and we're playing in their playground, and they make the rules. They've changed the rules. That is, even if we have a thousand subscribers or ten thousand, we are not going to be reaching them anymore, like we used to. In the old days, a few years ago, yes, all your 10,000 followers have chosen to follow you, and therefore your content would be visible to them. Facebook now actively doesn't show your content to your followers. Uh, there is a way around that, 
and that's by paying Facebook. Now, I cover that in the social media class. That's the short answer, and there's a bigger answer to that. But yes, unfortunately now, if you, uh, you want to reach that audience, uh, the big, big Facebook audience, it's about, it's about paying for your audience. Twitter and all of the other networks are still a little bit more about you get a follower and, and the follower sees the content on Snapchat, on Instagram, on every other network except Facebook. And I don't doubt that the other networks will follow Facebook's lead because they're the industry leader. Now maybe because of the recent uh, congressional scrutiny and such and the public backlash, maybe they will change their tactics, but when you are that big, who knows? Mm -hmm. Yep, and you're seeing that on Instagram as well. Instagram was an independent company until it was bought by Facebook. They left it alone for a long time. They left it alone for a long time until uh, a year and a half ago or two, and now they're really changing it, and now it's feeling a lot more like Facebook. Adds every other post and such. Yeah, there's a bunch of new terms. Even Twitter put out some new terms and such. I haven't read them, and no one will, but hopefully someone will, and will tell us the, the gist of it and how to be mad. So um, here on uh, Facebook, uh, these are these actions, which are the same on every network. On YouTube, someone can give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. Someone can reply to your YouTube video. Someone could share your YouTube video. Someone can uh, follow your YouTube account, and maybe you're making sales from YouTube. All of the networks have these variations. So just because I mentioned Facebook, think about how all of these are important in every network. Uh, I could have my conversion of getting more followers. That's fine, because ultimately I'm trying to get to the final conversion of sales. Get site visits on Google Plus. So Google Plus is another social network. It's Google's social network. Uh, a social network tied to Google properties. So the Google company um, owns the Google Plus social network. If you've never heard of Google Plus, it's like Facebook, it's like Twitter, it's like Instagram. It's a place to share photos and videos and chat and all of that. And you get likes and replies. Well, if I'm already on Facebook and maybe Twitter, why do I care about another social network? Google Plus, a social network tied to Google properties. What else does the Google company own or manage? YouTube, YouTube yes. Anything else? Maps, Google Maps. Ways. Um, YouTube Gaming, too. Gaming, the, the YouTube gaming channel. We've got um, a little thing you might have heard of called Google Mail or Gmail. Gmail. Um, and um, Android. Android. So if you've got an Android phone, it's powered by Google. When you get an Android device, it's got Google Plus right there. Sign in. When you create, when you get an Android phone, it says, okay, you need an account, create a Gmail. You want to look up maps to driving directions, you know, you're on your phone, you look up driving directions, Google Map. Well, I'm a business, and I have a physical location. I want to get on the map. I want to get on Google Maps. Going via the Google Plus route will let you create your little pin on the map. So... Being active on Google Plus for business puts you on the map, puts you on search results. Google company also owns Google Search, the biggest search engine. And the search engine, Google, being they're all going to claim our results are unbiased, here's the best results you can be a little cynical and say, well, if I'm on Google+, and Facebook is a competing social network, my results of my account on Google+, may show up higher than Facebook. And Google will tell you, no, all results are completely unbiased. And probably they are, but it wouldn't hurt us to think in terms of if I get on their social network, they might promote me a little more 
than the competitor's social network. It is, it is a little bit of the extra effort of now managing Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter, but the more places that you exist, that's the SEM, the more places you exist, the more possibility your site could show up. Being active puts you on their search, and as you exist more outside of your website... Now Google has a cell phone, Pixel 2. Yes, the Google, the Google official phone, the Pixel, yeah, yeah. Pixel, the Pixel version two, Pixel two. So they, 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 you can have, you know, Google cradle to grave. Uh, yeah. Have your website, you can uh, show up more often, maybe, because again, all of this social media stuff, I, I mean, all of this SEO stuff, it, um, there's a lot of possibilities of why you show up higher than your competitor or vice versa. There's a lot of factors. Uh, get more hits on my home page. Okay, so home page, website home page. I often get people coming into the class after they've kind of educated themselves about all of this and especially social media and they say, well, it's, it's like I don't even need a website anymore. I just get on Facebook. I just get on, on Twitter or Instagram. And for some companies, it, it will work just to have a presence on Instagram. Uh, we have a client that uh, she is a jeweler, and she does very well by promoting herself and selling and such on Instagram. Instagram is a very visual, photo-heavy network. She's got jewelry to sell. She shows off the jewelry, the models, and everything, and it, it works well for her, and she makes sales. Uh, for, for many of us, most likely, however, we also need the website in addition to social media because this is where we have the most control. So some companies can do well only on social media, but most also need a website. There you have the most control. You are beholden to the terms of service that you didn't read but you agreed to when you created Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook and such. And for example, maybe I do fine art nudes and I sell those paintings and photos. Many of these websites have anti-nudity clauses, so I cannot put my art there at all. So you know my style of you know Gauguin paintings won't fly there because too much nudity. Uh, on my own website, I could put my own content of whatever I want. So, on their networks, you follow their rules. On your website, you have a lot less rules. You still have um, the, the rules of your provider, you buy your website at GoDaddy or Bluehost and such, and they still have some rules there. Um, and uh, they're much more lenient uh, uh, than these networks. Uh, they're very much like uh, the phone company, where the phone company is not responsible if, you, if you're calling and making bomb threats and doing harassment and all of that. They're a carrier for your message. They're not responsible. And for many of these websites, they have that somewhat of that leeway about what you can put on your website, but you can definitely get shut down. Uh, there's been the, the examples of many like Nazi uh, websites and uh, alt-right and extremist websites that have been shut down by these uh, providers that are saying, well, we don't want to be a part of that. It's too much of a liability for us, so we're shutting you down. Go somewhere else to do your website. Uh, but obviously for us, um, you know, we're not dabbling in extreme content, but our, uh, our own website, we have the most control of our content when we're on our own website. Uh, you can often do things here that you can't there. For example, uh, you know, uh, newsletters, coupons and sales. Uh, Facebook has been experimenting with being able to sell products from Facebook, um, but you, you don't really sell directly your product off of Pinterest. You still guide people over to eBay or your website or Etsy or whatever. 
Um, most of these social networks don't have the way to sell directly off of them. On my website, I can create my whole shopping cart there and, and do the credit card transactions and everything. Get more shares on my blog posts from my site. So, okay, we've got blogs here. Next month, on the first week of June, I'm teaching the blog class, writing blogs, setting up a blog. So very briefly here, blogs, uh, writings. So Victor, yeah. uh, email marketing is uh, part of website or another strategy? Which marketing? Email marketing. Email marketing. Email. It's, uh, I've got it listed right here over subscribers. Oh, okay. I'll get to that in a oh, moment. Okay. Uh, writings that you create on your site on a regular basis. Uh, in the blog class, I would go into much more detail, but very, very, very basic. 100 words per month of new content. Very, very, very short answer. Longer answer will be in the class. But uh, here is we're creating content. I wrote here content. So articles filled with keywords of the of the topic of your business that you're publishing so the search engines can find you. That's the purpose of the blog in a very basic way. I'm gonna write content, I'm gonna write articles. I've got Victor's Bakery, I'm gonna write an article, the best chocolate chip cookie ever. And then I'm going to write my article about it and give a version of the recipe, maybe not the recipe we use at the restaurant, at the bakery, but a version of that recipe and then write a little bit about it and, and be humorous and show pictures and whatever. Well, then someone's going to be searching one day. Uh, they want to make cookies with their kids. Uh, so I go online and I, and I search, best chocolate chip cookie recipe. Well, I've got an article with those keywords, with that content, I might get found. I might get the traffic to my website. They come to the website, they get, the, they get that free article on how to make their own cookie, and they see pictures and stuff, and they, at the end of the article it says, uh, use this coupon code for 10% off a dozen cookies. So I'm stealth marketing with a free item, a free article. I'm still self-promoting, um, because ultimately I want to sell those, uh, those cookies myself. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm giving out a free version of the recipe that isn't quite as good as the ones we sell. It never turns out quite right. Uh, so then they buy our version. Articles titled with search terms can help you get found. So there's plenty of articles out there like how to build a WordPress website. Well, people were searching for that. And a company, a web design company, might create that article because they want to get traffic to their website. They're going to give you the advice on how to create it yourself. And then the person reads it and they feel, this is more complicated than I thought. I might contact these people that are giving the article and maybe hire them or, or at least check their prices. Okay, get subscribers to my coupon newsletter. Okay, so this is all about the email marketing. This is another aspect uh, of SEM. So another captive audience. You build an email list of willing um, buyers, willing um, willing customers. You have to entice people to subscribe and have content. They care to read. The newsletters and the emails and all of that are just another form of all of this marketing that ultimately I'm trying to convince people, buy this cupcake, subscribe to my magazine, hire me uh, and my business and such. 
So I um, have to convince people, entice people, to subscribe. And I have to keep them subscribed by creating content that they care about reading. So bad is having a button on my website that simply says newsletter. There's a website, there's a spot there with, to put your email, and then it says newsletter. OK, better. Something like subscribe to our tips newsletter. There is a button for them to, there's a box for them to put their email address, and then it's labeled as subscribe to our tips newsletter. Here they're getting an example of what they're going to get. They're going to get tips. They're on my website about web design or whatever. And uh, I want them to subscribe to that newsletter because I'm going to be marketing to them. But they're going to be getting tips, free advice and such on my newsletter. Something that might be best depending on your audience and such. Uh, Learn, oh, let's see, um, learn about healthy baking. OK, Victor's Bakery, I'm trying to sell cupcakes and all of that. I have a newsletter. I want to capture people's email address. Uh, so I might have a, something a little better, learn about healthy baking. OK, again, this is the marketing speak that is harder to, to develop. Uh, without practice, without examples. But the way that I might say this is best is, again, these marketing terms, healthy, and these terms about trying to convince people of, of something. Learn. We're going to teach you healthy baking tips and recipes. Everyone wants that. They, they want to have something tasty, but also healthy. And um, we're going to offer that in our newsletter, in addition to purpose of the newsletter another avenue to market to a willing audience they subscribed to your newsletter because they cared about your items your products and all of that and therefore it's not outlandish that then in your newsletters maybe once in a while or in the corner you also have some sort of sales pitch uh, something about use this coupon or sale this Saturday and that sort of thing so if your newsletter is only about like you know the free advice or the industry news and such it might not be as effective as it could be because you're also not using it for marketing stuff and sales stuff it is a fine line uh, to walk between you know a, a useful newsletter that people want to read and a newsletter full of commercials so it's kind of complex sometimes I think uh, the conversion for email marketing, I think, is pretty hard. It's lower. I think it's it's harder, yes, in, on the newsletters. We're, we're so jaded by spam in our inboxes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, it does have to really work hard and rise above the rest about convincing people to subscribe, to stay subscribed, and then from the newsletters to convince them to take the conversion, to do the conversion. get virtual clients, aka followers, to come to my physical location. Uh, so um, this one does not apply to everyone because let's say I'm a plumber and I go to your business to fix your, 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 your plumbing. So uh, I'm not, I don't want people to come to my location, which is my house. Uh, I work out of my house, so that doesn't work there. Uh, let's say again also, okay, I'm a lawyer. Uh, you're not going to come to my house. You're going to come to my office building if, if I have one. Uh, if I'm Victor's Bakery, okay, well, that one's obvious. I have a location on Main Street. I want people to visit on Main Street. So I need to convince. I need to uh, have some of these virtual clients. I need to get some of these followers that are following me online to come to the, to the actual place, the, the location. That, that could be difficult. 
for local followers. How can you use social media to convince people to visit your location? You can have exclusive sales about, uh, you know, posting on Facebook. Come to our Facebook and, and click like and show us for a free cupcake. Well, oftentimes that, that free stuff works because someone's like, well, I'm already here. I got a free cupcake. My, my son wants one, I guess. I'll get him one too. Uh, you know, you are trying to uh, be, maximize your time being there. You got one free thing. Well, I'm already here. I might as well get X, Y, and Z. So for something free, you might get more out of it. Uh, so some sort of enticement to come to the physical location. Get, get X free if you show us your, your like. Or take a selfie in front of our restaurant and post it on social media, hashtag Victor's Bakery. Show us, you get a free dessert next time. So this, of course, only works for my followers that are in the, the location. I might have followers all over the world. They're not going to be able to do the some of those so it's just not able to be done but if I'm able to think of an idea about how can I convince people to come to my physical location I should I should try to do it snap a selfie at the store and show us for something And then the last one, get clients to buy my cupcakes. Ultimate conversion. Every other one of there was a conversion. Uh, this is the one, the ultimate one about actually making money. But all of these are helpful to get ultimately here. If I'm saying my, my, my important conversion, my ultimate conversion is to sell. Again, it's very easy. Uh, to uh, do a follow and a like and all of that, but then suddenly it's so difficult to click buy. And um, you should see that it's a long, involved process to get from point A, which is a potential client follows you on Twitter, to point Z, a follower visits the store and buys the product. That's why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. <coughs> it's what you need to do on your website as well as outside of it. What am I doing on my website? What am I doing on my website? What am I doing outside of my website? Physical location. It's, it all comes together. <coughs> what you're doing on your website, what you're doing outside of your website. In emerging... Yeah. Good. Yeah. If you're able to combine both online and yeah. offline. Also, an emerging term that takes <coughs> both into account is content marketing. This content that we're creating, these tweets, these blog posts, and all of that, it's marketing. How do we market it? If you follow this link, there are some ideas here that you can check out. This is from Forbes.com. Uh, scrolling down examples, five content marketing examples. One, infographics. Uh, well, I don't know what an infographic is. It'll, it'll tell you there. Um, web pages, podcasts, videos, books. So here's more ideas of content that you can create to help you get visibility. Uh, traffic and then ultimately I'm trying to get sales okay so that was page two of that handout uh, these are ideas 
of what you could do for your business. You don't have to do them all. And if they still don't make sense, uh, you can ask questions, you can look them up and such. But the idea is that if I'm not on social media, if I'm not writing blogs, if I'm not thinking about ways to also market in the real world, uh, that could be one of the reasons why the business is not as successful as it could be. Uh, the bigger companies do as many of these things as possible to reach an audience. Back when there were three TV channels, it was so easy or a lot easier to sell products and for businesses to do well because the attention span was so focused on those three channels. Then we got the fourth channel and then we got 500 channels and now we've got the internet and video games and everything. And so there's so much uh, things to look at easy to dis to get distracted so if we our business is on as many places as we can be where we believe our audience is at we can capture the audience any questions on these topics on page two we're gonna jump back to page one in just a moment we're gonna take one more break this time a, a short one because this whole part here is about uh, connecting our website to the search engines. Um, if, if you've got a website at, at the moment that you can actually use for this activity, uh, we're gonna take a little break for you to gather your login information and such and make sure it works and all of that. Uh, if you don't have that information, uh, that's okay. You can still follow along. I'll be recording this and you can apply it uh, a little later. So let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll start to actually do this. Um, we'll be back at 11, at 12.05.